you, you may think that this title here it's, is a bit, um, bit cryptic, maybe. So I, hopefully at the end of, of the presentation, it will be a bit, bit clearer for you. Uh, I will try to speak during roughly 30 minutes to, to keep time for discussion and questions afterwards. Um, so today I will take a certain angle on a very vast topic. So I'm, I'm not play, planning to cover the entire spectrum of creativity and decision support and decision making aspects. But here I will take a certain perspective following ma mainly complex systems. And um, so my presentation will be, first I will try to describe the context and the problems that we, we could encounter. Uh, after that, I will try to bring few ideas and developments. Uh, so mainly at that stage, introducing some key concepts. I, I will not describe the entire theory behind that, but I will after that show for you some examples, concrete examples of how we can, let's say, leverage ideas and, and, and concepts to, to develop uh, let's, a support system a bit to, to facilitate decision making and also boost creativity. Um, sorry. And, uh, and, and it will conclude like that on few examples and afterwards hopefully um, it will lead to some discussion. Uh, it's it's a still an, a, a, a topic uh, under development so there is still a lot of things to do in this area but um, uh, you, we, we, we will see together uh, how, how this could be developed also in the near future. But let's start first with this element. So if you check the, the news, the newspapers, you could see you have a massive amount of uh, situations where you have failures, delays in complex engineering pro projects. Here I just listed a few of them. Uh, French railway op operators, SNCF, they, ha they bought trains which were too large for the train stations. So you have probably heard about that. Uh, the massive delay in all kiloauto, okay? Uh, you have also a massive delay in Flamanville in France for similar type of systems. A uh, few days ago, Spanish transport system noticed that they ordered trains that are not basically able to, to, to go into tunnels. They are too big. Um, you have massive problems, for example, with planes, uh, um, with Boeing at the moment. They, they have uh, serious problems. The British Army, they seem to have a serious problem also with their new development si system. So they are even planning to stop the whole project. They have spent uh, multiple billions euros already on that, on that problem. Uh, Finnish forces, they bought a fighter who, who seems to have a lot of problems. Uh, and probably you have heard, but there, there is a secret report saying that the uh, Pentagon is maybe even planning to cut the entire program, perhaps. So, so you see here, you have a huge amount of uh, massive problems related to, to complex systems development. So wh why is it like that? Um, here is it few questions. Is it due to a lack or loss of important skills? Most probably yes, the answer is yes, but is it, is it the only answer to the problem? Perhaps not. Uh, are the new design systems too complex? Perhaps, but we, we, we will try to answer to that a, a bit later. And what are the characteristics of those systems making them so complex to design? So here I would like to address at least partly a few of these questions. So, F this question, perhaps, and mainly this one, okay? So what I will do now, I will start by asking questions because the design process often is st it's starting with few questions. So what are the important questions usu usually that you, you have to ask yourself when you start designing something? In your life, when you make an important decision, I don't know, buying a flat or building something, you, you, you have first important decision to take, where to buy this place. Uh, and this element, this initial decision will, will be very, very constraining for the rest of, the, of your project. So if you take a wrong initial decision, it will be very difficult or even impossible to correct this later, okay? So here, one element, uh, early decisions and very, very important. 
So, but we have many other questions. So what are the needs and objectives when we try to design something? Uh, what are the standards and regulations that we have to follow? And they are becoming more and more important. Uh, what are the problems to solve? So it's not ob always obvious that uh, wh what is the problem to be solved? So often it's quite unclear and, and uh, fuzzy at the very beginning of a project. Uh, how to solve them? So we see now with the growing amount of cyber physical systems that the way of solving problems could, uh, you could have uh, millions, uh, on, and rid of millions of possible combinations of solutions, both technologically and, uh, and uh, using different source of energies and so on. Uh, and what are the decisions to take? When should we take these decisions? And what type of information is available to take this decision? And uh, usually this is a kind of critical uh, element because at early stage we have very often uh, fuzzy qualitative type of information but nevertheless we need to be able to exploit this type of information to take decision. So here a few questions. Uh, after that usually we have a kind of design process. When we design something we, we move from steps to steps and you have some kind of standardized approach and uh, here it's a IEEE standard showing you, you start usually with requirement analysis and verification, uh, functional analysis and verification, design synthesis, design verification, manufacturing integration and so on until the end of the life cycle. But you have now, nowadays also something coming into the picture, data production. So you produce data basically all along this cycle but also during the use phase. So most of your equipment, my phone here, uh, camera, many many things, they are producing data and these data are used nowadays also by companies to basically help them design better product or better services. So we have to integrate this data production in our process also. So if we compare now uh, all the way of developing systems, let's say when computers were not yet existing, and uh, techniques we are using nowadays. All these yellow blocks here are, have been completely transformed, or they are, they are new for some of them, and some of them are, have been heavily transformed. So we have much more standards and regulations to follow. Uh, the needs and objectives, if you take, for example, a nuclear power plant, it's it's a massive amount of, uh, of objective and elements that you, you need to fulfill. Some of them are also even sometimes contradictory. Uh, and the way to solve problem, and you have an increasing amount of possible solu technical solutions and combinations of solutions, and the amount of information available is, is not always massive. So, uh, we, we talk about machine learning and massive amount of data, but it's not, not always available, especially at the early stage when we develop new products. So, what is the current situation? The current situation is usually humans, they are overwhelmed uh, from a cognitive point of view, and this is due to the mo modern systems development. So, because of all these changes, our cognitive capabilities are basically completely surpassed by, by the complexity of the problems. Second, the scale and amount of requirements, standards and regulations to be considered are usually outside our human capabilities. So if you take all Kilo Auto, for example, project, you could say that probably the whole set of requirements will even not be contained in this whole room if you if you will have it in form of paper form, okay? So it's not, even the people cannot read them, all of them during, during the duration of a project. Early decisions, they have a fundamental importance, but they must be done in a context where the amount and nature of the information is limited and ill-defined. So by ill-defined, I mean not well, not known very well, and very often also qualitative and with very few amount of quantitative information. Uh, and you have the modern systems, uh, 
they are most of the time cyber physical systems and we talk more and more about systems of systems. So for example, a plane is not is a system by itself, but is not functioning alone. It's functioning in connection with radars, with uh, ground station, with all, all kinds of other systems, and they form a super system called a system of systems. So this is increasing the level of complexity in a, in a tremendous manner. And this data production that I was mentioning is pervasive and ubiquitous and it's influencing the design process heavily, okay? So having this situation now, what could be, let's say, the potential solutions? What could be the road for ideas to, to, to help us coping with this, with this type of situation? In, ter in terms of cognitive load, um, there is works already showing that, for example, concept maps, so concept maps I will, present something called causal graph a bit later, but if you imagine a graph with nodes and with edges and with connections between these nodes and edges, and these concept maps, it shows, it, sh it, it, it has been shown already that it's changing the neurocognition way of approaching problem. So it has been tested with students and it, it proved to be efficient in some contexts, okay? Uh, scale and amount of, requirements, how to cope with that. So here we will probably need a kind of new computer tool support uh, to complement our human capabilities and help us to analyze and process more efficiently this massive amount of data. The early decision, uh, here one idea is to use a, a branch of AI, of artificial intelligence, called qualitative physics. And it was, it was a branch developed very active in the 1980s. It has, it has more or less vanished at the moment, but uh, the, the, this qualitative physics could be very useful because it could handle qualitative reasoning. So basically, reasoning with increase of something, decrease of something else. And using this kind of qualitative elements, you can generate a kind of logic allowing you to propagate uh, objectives like that in graphs. Uh, modern c cyber physical system here, we, we will need, and it's basically what systems engineering tries to do, to develop languages, basically to a unified modeling framework and language to, to combine basically languages of different domains and, and disciplines. For example, UML or SysML, or OPM in Israeli techniques, they, they allow to do that in some extent, but I think it's not sufficient. Uh, in terms of data production here, what element which is really important in my viewpoint is to, to allow knowledge extraction in order to, for humans to understand, um, uh, to be explainable, so to, to have explainable knowledge that human could understand because many of the techniques at the moment, they are some kind of black box techniques. You, you have inputs, outputs, but you don't know really what's happening inside. So for humans, it's impossible almost to, to understand uh, how the, this, these tools works properly. So based on, on, on this kind of uh, red possible ideas, I tried here to, to go into some parts of, 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 of this question. So I'm, I'm not covering the entire spectrum, but I will cover something which is called uh, similitude theory. So here in this room, who is uh, familiar with similitude theory? No, nobody? So similitude theory was developed when computers were not yet existing. And uh, when you, at the beginning they were re used, for example, if you want to build a, um, a boat, a huge boat, you, you have first to make a prototype, small scale prototype, and be sure that this prototype will behave like the real scale boat. So they develop a mathematical theory to do that. And it's still used nowadays. For example, you, you have, for example, people designing boats. You see, they, they make first small scale boats and representing the real scale boat. But using this, you, you have a, some, something called scaling factors 
that are allowing you to generate models that works for different scaling. It's the same model, one model for many, many different size of, of systems. So it's, it's used, for example, you see this, it's a wind tunnel and you have the real plane here. So the same technique is used in aeronautic. Okay, so the idea is to you to maybe exploit this thing, so to this similarity principle and this similitude theory to, to develop a kind of approach helping us to solve some of these questions. So this is one element. Second, it's, uh, this theory belongs to something a bit broader called dimensional analysis theory. And this one, you know more, more or less for sure something like that. At school, when you were doing a bit of physics, you, you, you have seen, for example, this Newton equation uh, with force equal mass multiplied by acceleration. And you have learned with your teacher that on the left side it should be Newton, but on the right side it should be also Newton. So you have something called dimensional homogeneity. And this is a basic principle of dimensional analysis theory. But this theory goes much further than that. And it's, it, I would like to use it here, uh, and especially something called the vashi buckingham theorem. And this vashi buckingham theorem, in fact, it's just a reformulation of this equation, and I will show you. This equation here could be written in this, in this way. So here we have exponents. Here, they are, they are not visible. Here, you have one and one, but they, they are not really explicit here. But basically, you create ratios, ratios of variables. And this ratio here, it's dimensionless. It has no unit, if you want, OK? And this, this basic element here is the bas basic principle behind this similarity th theory that you have here. You build here in the middle these dimensionless numbers. And these dimensionless numbers, they are the same for the small scale boat and the same for the big scale boat, okay? And uh, so we will use that. And, uh, and the, the very interesting point here is that these power laws that you have here, they are present everywhere in nat nature. So in fact, uh, if you see this plane, for example, which was, by the way, the, De destroyed during the attack of Ostomel in, in Ukraine. It was a Antonov plane. Uh, the, so the size of the plane and, uh, and the power of his motors and the size of the wings, they are covered by this pi theorem. Uh, these elephants here, the size of the elephant, the size of his length and heart, and the amount of blood he has is, is covered also and exp could be explained by that. Humans, when we are running, our speed is dependent on our size, our, the, the um, power of our muscles, and this could be also described with pi numbers. These electronic circuits, their size and the power consumption could be also described with pi numbers. The delta of a river could be also described <coughs> in this shape by, by these numbers. And for example, if you take this rocket here, you have something called Tsiolkovsky rocket equation, and it's containing already three pi numbers. Okay, so it's 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 a it's a very um, let's say ubiquitous approach that you could use probably to to represent many technical systems. So the idea is to start using that. So I, I will not present here the theory behind that, but. The key idea is that you could represent the knowledge or many form of knowledge in form of a, a pi number equations plus a graph. And in my graph here, it's a causally ordered graph. So it means that by writing an equation, I'm implicitly defining a, a, cause, a causal order, so cause-effect relationships. So why, why is this is important? Because humans, when we take actions or when we decide, we um, cognitively we have the tendency to think in terms of cause-effect relationships. So here's the idea: it's to take benefit of that to to develop a theory which is natural for humans. So 
the colors, I will not explain them here in detail, but green color means uh, independent variable, so influenced by nothing. Blue variable means a, a variable influence itself by something else. Okay, so green variable, it's easier to control, and the blue variable, it's a bit harder. Okay? But using this uh, causal graph theory, we can basically, we, we have multiple benefits for, for, for that. We can modify the neurocognition of users. So we can have the users being in a certain mindset mode, which will be uh, favoring certain type of, uh, of, of, of work. We are also, because of this uh, na natural human cognition with cognitive effect relationship, it's called, for, Kahnem for Kahneman itself, it's one of the cognitive bias. So it's a, for them, it's a negative element, but we, it's in fact something which has been developed over time for humans as a way of surviving in our environment. So the idea here is to try to exploit this kind of natural feature to, 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 be, to design also better system. Uh, after that, we, it can lead also easily because we have a graph structure. We can, we can make computer program easily with that. We can use matrices. We can use linear algebra techniques. So it's, it's quite easy to develop computer systems with that. And to generate these models, we, we can have multiple starting points. So one starting point are the requirements that I was mentioning before. So they are the starting point of, of the design process. Or we can use directly equations. So if we found equation in literature, we can use them directly. Or latest, we could use also, you see, data sets. So I can use data collected by sensors, for example, or generated during the design process. So here I just present very briefly a kind of software platform that we, we have developed running around uh, this causal graph. So you see the central brick here is a generation of a causal graph using multiple starting points and leading to different type of applications on the right side. So here I don't describe in detail these applications, but you have some of them, they are, let's say, machine learning type of applications. So they, these ones, uh, some elements here are related to optimization aspects. So when you have to, to opti optimize between two opposite criteria, you have to find a trade-off. So what is the right trade-off? It could be developed using this kind of optimization techniques. And uh, here we, we can also do qualitative reasoning. So this is interesting for humans. And this is where the creativity aspect is coming from. And in creativity, I highlighted here the concept of contradictions. So I would like now to introduce very briefly the concept of contradiction, because it's very central in my viewpoint to, to understand how creativity is coming into this picture. So contradiction, it, it's, here I, I take a definition coming from the trees theory. Who is familiar with trees theory? Could you raise hands if you, if, if, if you have heard about it? No? So trees theory, it's a, basically a Soviet-based technique that was created by a, a, a scientist in, in Soviet Union in 1942, in sorry. His name was Genrich Schuller. Uh, he, he was w working a bit like um, Einstein in the patent office. And in patent office of Soviet Union, he discovered that there is laws showing that you have some very good patents. They are usually a little, small group of patents. Uh, which are very good, and some others are average, and you have poor patents. And he, he, he wrote a letter to Stalin saying that he managed a way to improve the Soviet science, and the result was that he was sent to Gulag. And, but in Gulag, he was with a, gr a group of, of top Soviet scientists, and he developed his theory at that time because they were teaching to each other. And, and he, these three techniques came out of that. So it, it, it became a kind of secret theory uh, during all Soviet time. And it, it, it was known from Western, Westerners only when Soviet Union collapsed. 
And, uh, and this theory is super interesting theory. You have a lot of interesting concepts inside, but one is the concept of contradiction. So, and contradiction is basically a very well-known concept also in, in philosophy, in Kantian ph philosophy, Hegelian philosophy, Marxist-Leninist philosophy. But you hear basically a contradiction is a conflict that puts incompatible requirement on functional properties. So it's one possible definition of a contradiction. But basically here, if we represent this in form of a graph, uh, we, we have basically in trees two types of contradiction, one called technical contradiction. Imagine that I modify A here. If I modify A, it may improve B, but same time degrade B, C, okay? This is called the technical contradiction. Uh, something else called physical contradiction is when B, you would like to maximize it and minimize it at the same time. So in our case, we are working a lot with physical contradictions because physical contradictions, we want in the trees theory not to make a trade-off, which is a classical design strategy. But what we would like to do is to overcome and remove the contradiction. So for that, we, we have a kind of uh, idealist type of uh, invention principle that we will apply to remove completely the contradiction. And, uh, and we will use something called um, separation principle. So when you are facing a contradiction, it's also valid in life, uh, you have usually three types of strategies. One, it's a separation. You separate the contradictory parts. Second strategy, you try to satisfy both of these elements. It's sometimes feasible, but not always. And third aspect, you try to bypass it using something called in the three theories, the nine windows. I, I will not analyze satisfaction and bypass today, but what I would like to show is how we can use separation in, in, three, in four different aspects. Separation in time first. So for example, uh, light uh, in, in a, to stop, it's a separation in time. So the property uh, green is valid at some period of time and the property or orange or red is valid at some other point of time. So you see using, it's a concrete uh, exploitation of the separation principle in time. Uh, if I want to separate also I could separate in space. So some of you have glasses here. So glasses it's uh, when you have uh, to separation to see close and far. Uh, it's a concrete example of the separation in, sp in space. Okay, so we have also something called separation in scale. So for example, the bicycle chain is one example of separation in scale. So you have the part here, it's, it's rigid, but the whole chain is flexible. So you see it, it has two opposite properties. Uh, and I could also do separation upon condition. And for example, when you are ice skating on ice, you are doing that. Or if you are skiing, you are doing that. You, you have the, the ice, it's hard, but under your skate, you will create a small amount of flexible water uh, uh, solution. And so you will have, have hard and uh, uh, soft at the same time, okay? and it will allow you to glide on the, on, 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 on the ice. So here, using the, only the separation principle, we can solve a lot of technical problems, but also problems in life, in, in real life. So here I would like to show now, so here it was a brief overview of some concepts. I'm not sh showing how I'm creating my graphs but I will show you how I could exploit now this graph in concrete problems. So here, a few examples. Uh, here it's a, a requirement extraction and analysis tool that we developed. Uh, starting from a, a, a text, we are able to basically extract the basic mat um, um, engineering material required to start designing system. And uh, so we develop a software tool basically able here to simply 
take these parts of, of elements that we call requirements. The, then, when we have done that, we are able to apply a certain amount of quality metrics to evaluate if these elements are properly written or not. In engineering design, you have something called boilerplates. They are some kind of, uh, sorry, they are some kind of, um, if you want, of uh, standards or classical way of writing requirements, and they are usually used to do that. In our case, we are applying rules from uh, elements from boilerplates, but also from uh, um, natural language processing techniques. After that, you could, with these requirements, cluster them into groups, because one activity in engineering design and in systems engineering is to allocate requirements to part of a system or to modules or elements. For example, in a car, uh, the engine block will, will be associated with a certain amount of requirements, and they are in the cabin of, of, your, of your vehicle, you will have all the set of requirements. So you separate these requirements, and you could do it also purely on, a, on, on based on analysis of the commonalities and similarities between requirements. Uh, we also, what we, we, we did also, we are analyzing contradictions between requirements. So you saw the concept of contradiction. We are now looking for contradictions inside our requirements. Because if we have opposite contradictory requirements, they will be source of problem later. Okay? So, I'm so here it's a concrete example how we could use develop a software tool to support this initial stage of the design. This software tool, we would like to apply it also to, to simulate requirements, to simulate them as early as possible. But you remember we are, we are using dimensional analysis and we are using units. And these units, they are coming from the international system of units. But in life, you have many things that you cannot measure using meter, length, weight, and so on. You have me metrics, for example, in computing science, if in cybersecurity, how do you evaluate the availability, for example. Availability is feasible, it's in time, using time, but you have many other concepts that are not possible to evaluate using classical metrics. So, for that, if we would like to expand this theory to other domains and simply physics and, and engineering, we need a certain approach. And for the idea is to start here using linguistic description of concepts. And in fact, it works. We, we manage to transform using different type of mathematical techniques this linguistic description into, at the end, the, the, the unit described to, you, to, to, to measure, for example, velocities <coughs> could be measured in kilometer per hour. And here you find that it's kilometer per hour, uh, starting from the linguistic description here. Okay? So if I combine these two blocks, I will be able to simulate uh, the impact of changes in requirements very early in the development process. So you see it's a work in progress. It's something that we are developing right now. Um, second element, we developed a tool allowing to represent a technical uh, a system. For example, in this case, it's an underwater drone uh, in form of a causal graph. And using objectives that I define on the red nodes here, I can propagate this objective in my graph and detect in yellow where I will have contradictions. So when I detect it contradiction, I can use that as a kind of enabler for engineering design. And here you, you have an example on this drone example uh, where step by step, line by line, I modify gradually the design of my drone to remove step by step the contradictions. And each time a graph is associated with a technical solution. So if I analyze the first graph here, I have yellow uh, circle around a gray box. A gray box basically means that this variable is exogenous. 
So it's outside the border of my system. It's in, in a way a variable belonging to the external environment. Okay, and in, in that case, uh, for the drone, the external environment will be, for example, the seawater. The seawater has a property, for example, of viscosity and density. And, and they are properties that usually you cannot control because they don't belong to your system. So here the idea, it's using the separation principle to generate some kind of artificial viscosity and density that will of a, of a liquid or fluid that will be stored inside my drone. And then I will push the liquid with a pump in front of the drone and, and the drone will not fly, uh, be into water, but it will go into a bubble of water, or of gas, sorry. So you see, it's a concrete uh, use of the graphs used to generate innovative solutions. And by the way, this is something called Xval Torpedo. It's a system developed by, by Soviet Union, basically. Uh, if we can, but by creating this new graph here, I will generate new type of contradictions. So it's a kind of evolutionary process, if you want. Here you could imagine that each step it's a stage of evolution. And here in second step, I, create, I could release, for example, a, a kind of dense fluid behind my drone, and it will help my drone to, to go faster. And I, I could also here, a bit like on the golf ball, I could put dimples. So they are, in a way, increasing the frontal surface of the, of the drone, so decreasing, basically, the, the frontal pressure due to drag force. Uh, I could streamline the structure of the drone also to, to, to remove all the contradiction. And here I could put a bit like, if you, if you check the skin of sharks, they have uh, the microstructure of the skin is composed of uh, small um, 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 uh, small elements like that, that that will reduce drastically the drag force. So, for example, you uh, Airbus or Boeing, for example, they are now painting their, their planes with this kind of special paint containing these microstructural elements, and it decreases significantly the, the the consumption. Of, of this, of this. So here you could see that using this this approach, I could change gradually the design of my drone, and at the end, I could basically combine all, all these discoveries into a new concept. So it's a design tool gen favoring creativity and innovation. What we have done, we have also used it to generate what we call meta model. Meta models they are some kind of simplified models. So here it's a um, polymer, um, uh, so it's a console model, so a finite element model, so quite heavy model. Uh, it, it takes quite big computing time and power. Uh, to, to, it's mimicking here what we, what's happening when we do 3D printing, additive manufacturing of plastics. <coughs> And uh, the idea is that this model is expensive because it, it costs a lot of time. So we replace it by a simplified model. So we use our technique to generate simpler models that will help us um, also pilot the machines more efficiently. We do that also for a process called wire arc additive manufacturing. So it's basically a robot with uh, a, to a welding torch, and we use it to print metallic parts. And, uh, but these metallic parts, the properties of the metal itself, depends a lot about the thermal um, history of the part. So because we are bringing energy, we are melting material, and we, it, it, it will, dry, it will um, sorry, um, become solid, and we, we will re-melt re it. In, in, in cycles like that. And this kind of process is, is basically, we need to control it if we want to ensure that we are making parts that are, could be used in practice. So for that, we are using a metamodeling technique to predict basically the thermal history and thermal patterns of these parts. Okay? Uh, we, here it's a uh, co collaboration with a 
group of a, a group in um, in our university with Tina Salmi. She's a specialist of superconductivity, and uh, it's a work done also with CERN. Uh, here, it's a design of a superconductive magnet, and this magnet is associated here with a, again with a heavy simulation of a FEM simulation, finite element simulation, and this simulation it, it takes roughly one hour for each simulation of a super, super compu computer. So the idea is to limit the amount of time we need to make this kind of simulations and to replace this heavy simulation with a simplified uh, representation here using our approach and with something called gray wolf optimizer. So it's, it's, if you want, it's a technique allowing you to explore all the design space. So basically all the possible combination of parameters to generate designs. And when we find an interesting zone, like this red zone, then we, we could ask the system for specific areas to give us a, another simulation in this specific area. So it's, it's called adaptative multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary optimization process. So it, and, but it used basically this kind of of similar approach that I was presenting here for you today. A last element here, it's a, a, a prothesis for athletics, for, for, uh, and, and this prothesis is printed, and we would like to combine the design aspects of the performance of the prothesis for the runner together with the manufacturing aspect. Will it be easy to manufacture? And with the combination of materials that we need to use. So for that, we used again this graph technique. And using this graph technique, it did generate something called Bayesian, a Bayesian network. And this Bayesian network will allow us to do some kind of virtual experiments. So we can ask ourselves, what is happening if I increase the size of this part? What is happening if I make this prothesis a bit harder or softer? And, and you could see statistically variation of different parameters. So it will help us basically optimize the design. And these Bayesian networks, by the way, they are used a lot in medicine also. Uh, in, in some cases, they have proved to be more efficient than medical doctors to, to, to find basically the, 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 to, to give a diagnosis on certain sicknesses. Uh, last element. Uh, this graph, we could use something called system dynamics, seed simulation. So we can simulate this graph very quickly in open source software, allowing us to see how <laughs> dynamically parameters are changing. So we can create, if you want, simulators very quickly. And we have used it in our lab. For example, we have retrofit a machine. We have, on this late, we have added two new functionalities here uh, a functionality for grinding and the functionality for 3D printing. Here we are adding a powder and we uh, using this, this equipment and we melt the powder to generate a, a hard surface here. And using this kind of uh, equipment, we are improving the quality of the surface. So this is done for a company called Sandvik. And uh, the idea is Sandvik, they are using a lot this, um, this, this, this grinding technology. It's kind of strategic technology for them. And, uh, but many of the guys who are specialists on that, they are now going re being retired. And uh, so they would like to make a digital twin in order to train newcomers <coughs> and also to, in the future, maybe be able to control remotely the, the equipment production equipments. And here it's basically, we, we used our technique to, to, to generate a mathematical model of that. And last element, <coughs> we, we have in our group two, two, two students, uh, Hossein Mokhtarian and uh, Antoine Keginer. They, they have uh, developed uh, a redesign for an EU, EU competition, a, a body of a train. And they, they used techniques called topology optimization uh, in order to, to print uh, a body, uh, not cast it like it is done usually for trains, but instead uh, using different type of materials. And here, 
uh, here you see, for example, this, this body have been printed in, in half the real size uh, using uh, WAM equipment. <laughs> so it's not in our lab, it, it was done in RAM lab in Netherlands, but uh, it's, we have similar equipment in our lab. And now the idea is maybe to, to continue with that. Uh, on, and last element, it's about um, collaborative robotic. And uh, one member of the group, uh, Joe David, developed basically a system allowing to, uh, here you, you see a, a human in a factory. Uh, in this factory, they are assembling parts of a machine <laughs> and he developed an ontology and a system based on agents. So more or less the same techniques that we have used, but an extension of it to, to have a robot and the human collaborating together to assemble the, the engine block. And uh, they, they could decide in real time who is doing what. But the, the main advantage of that is that we can change the type of elements that we will assemble uh, very easily and the all approach here will remain valid. So here are a few examples of what, what we could do with that. So thanks for, for this. <laughs>